So I asked you on Twitter if you would like to have content on cover design and the majority of you said yes. So here I'm going to deliver something about cover design. I decided to divide that uh, topic into two tutorials. So the first one, the one you're watching now, is going to cover a bit more about my personal journey on how I started doing cover designs, then also the research you should do before you actually start uh, with the design process and a couple of tips on how to yeah, get even started. And the second part is going to be the more practical one. In this one, we are going to design a uh, like a dummy cover starting from scratch using Blender. And that is going to involve some, some tips and tricks on how to approach uh, yeah, the actual design process. And uh, I'm also going to show you my workflow on how I, I design covers. So without further ado, I would like to uh, jump right into uh, the story on how I started doing cover design. So I actually started doing covers when I was a PhD student and the first cover that I ever designed, so the one that you see on screen here was done in 2011 and that was for uh, my PhD project. And uh, we were quite lucky because that was the first publication that came out um, from that project and we were asked to submit a cover. And this is in general how um, cover designs come across. I also would like to quickly touch on a question that came up in the Twitter poll that I did. And this was on how to actually uh, get your image on a cover. And it really depends. So there are two ways on how to, to approach that. So you could either be the scientist designing the image or you can be the scientific illustrator on how to do that. Sometimes those two things are intertwined, of course. So uh, in my time as a scientist, it was either my publication or it was a publication from my colleagues. And you are normally asked by uh, the editor when you get your letter of acceptance if you would like to submit a cover. That does not mean that your uh, image is going to definitely make it to the cover because a lot of other authors are asked the same question. And of course, a lot of other authors are going to submit their suggestion. So there is, of course, some sort of competition when it comes to yeah, landing a cover. Um, on the other hand, if you are a scientific designer, then of course your clients, so the scientists, are going to ask you to design the cover for them. But again, the same rules apply. So in my experience at least, I was never directly asked by a journal to do the cover design. So normally the process goes, the journal asks the authors to submit something, then the authors either design something or they ask a scientific illustrator to design something for them. The submission is always done by the authors. There might of course be exceptions to that, but as far as I'm aware, this is the common process on how to do that. So you either need to uh, make sure that your publications get an invitation or maybe you have colleagues uh, that are offered a cover and then they are going to ask you if you would like to do uh, an illustration for them. So that's the, the classical uh, route. Um, for that uh, specific cover, we were really lucky as well because uh, we submitted that cover. It was accepted as it is. And this is actually how um, my first creation made it on a cover. What you can also see is that the style of those covers back in yeah, 10 years ago um, was totally different than the style that you see nowadays. Back then, a lot of covers were really uh, photography heavy. 3D rendering tools were available, but they were mostly like um, tools for viewing scientific content like Pymol, for example. So the structure that you see in the background here was rendered with Pymol and later on all the content was compiled in Photoshop. Another fun fact for that cover was th that the poppy that you see here, so the plant in the foreground, uh, was grown by my grandma. So she grew it in her garden, so I had the chance to take a photo. We were quite lucky to have the tiny insect sitting there as an, like, like a, a neat, funny uh, addition to the photo. 
And this is how that cover, cover came across. Angewandte Chemie has something special as well. They always have um, circular covers. So you have a circle that you can fill with the content and this is going to, put on, going to be put on the cover. After that cover, of course, uh, since I did not do that professionally, um, I uh, did not have overly much chances to design covers, but I had quite some colleagues ask me if I would like to design covers for them. So throughout my PhD and postdoc time, it was probably something like six to eight covers or something that I designed uh, in total. Most of them were not from, for my own publications, but for colleagues of mine. And as I mentioned, uh, most of them were quite photography heavy. Um, as another example, um, uh, I would like to show you this one. That was also a photography heavy uh, cover design. That was actually an image I took on a hike. The topic of the cover was a cascade reaction and the cascade in the background, of course, fit perfectly. So when I was still a student, I decided to buy actually a used DSLR camera and that really was my companion for most of the trips that I went on. So I slowly built up a rather large library of images that uh, were easy for me to use because uh, that's of course also a copyright thing. So whatever you design or put on a cover, uh, you need to make sure that the copyright uh, is owned by you or that you have the permission to put it on there. And this is of course super easy if you make sure that you either create everything on your own or you take the photos by yourself, like uh, in that case. I did not get into 3D rendering and by that I mean using Blender um, until I decided to go for uh, becoming a scientific designer professionally. So when I started doing uh, those services or offering those services professionally, I also learned how to use Blender. And the first cover design that I actually uh, yeah, did using Blender was this one. It did not make it on the cover, but they had like something like an inside cover. It was basically the image and the short summary of the article um, uh, on the inside of, uh, of the cover. And this was the first really professional 3D rendering that I did. And I vividly remember when I did that design, I literally had to Google every step for every object or for, for every design uh, element in that cover here. So you see, I had to find a tutorial on how to do the crystals. Then uh, for this one for the first time also involved an emitter system to have those crystals like spread over the, over the plane there. And uh, also like the tiny elements that you see here, like depth of field, for example, was something that I was not aware of on how to do that. So every step of that cover, yeah, involved uh, a tutorial basically. And uh, of course it also took me quite long, but this is how you normally learn. And uh, this is how I actually learned Blender. So whenever I started doing a design and I wanted to do something, I first had to do research on how to do that. And um, that normally is uh, quite intensive, a, a quite intensive way of learning, but a very good one, because this is how I remembered all of those things. Of course, when you design uh, a cover, it is always a good idea to check first what kind of cover designs are, cl uh, are, are currently featured on, on the journal. Journals have different preferences because covers or the designs are chosen by humans and humans like certain things more than other things. So uh, before you even start with your design, it is a good idea to do some research in advance. So go to the journal, look at the last, let's say 10 covers and check how they uh, commonly look like. It doesn't mean that you should uh, copy one of the designs, but you can find a trend in that. So for example, um, dark cover designs are something that are quite common for the larger journals. And I can only guess why that is, so I have no insight in that, but I would assume that since the web pages are held with a white background, a dark cover design stands out more. So this is probably like um, a feature editors like because it looks nice on the website. The same is true for um, the degree of uh, information that you put on a cover. So you can have covers 
that are very detailed, that are very playful, like this one, for example. So this is a cover that was done again for Angewandte Chemie, not for me, but already in my, my time when I was a scientific designer. And we decided to go for something rather playful and very detailed. So you can look um, on that cover for a couple of minutes and disco always discover like new elements and new things that you haven't seen before. This is definitely a cover that uh, involves a lot of work because if there are a lot of details, then of course you have to make them uh, neat and precise. Uh, another uh, very playful approach would be this one, but um, it is like that kind of low poly uh, look cover. So even though there are a lot of details, uh, it is a bit um, yeah, more simplistic to look at. But again, on that cover, I try to incorporate more details and also some sort of stories. There is also um, a design that can be rather minimalistic. And this is something that is very often featured on the large journals like nature journals, science, uh, cell and so on and so forth. So this is an illustration for a nature subjournal, so nature catalysis, where we decided to have one object like in the center and uh, everything else that shows the complexity of the project more in the background and also blurred. I would recommend having a more simplistic approach in terms of the amount of content, but it can be really glossy and complicated in the style. Another example that I would like to show you is this one. So that's an image that made it on the cover of Cell, as you can see. And it basically follows the same principle. So you have one element that you put in the focus of the illustration and um, there is nothing else that's there. Of course, there is a lot of something that I would call decoration in that case here, but the main focus in that case is really the structure. The decoration, uh, on the other hand, is something that should be related to the uh, scientific content. So in that case, it is uh, the connection of where the structure comes from. There is a lot of detail, as you can see, in that kind of very lush looking like uh, green area. So it's really like a jungle. And this is also something that's crucial. If you incorporate, like in this image, a lot of tiny details, make sure that they are as realistic as possible. So if you think of a jungle, it's not only like one sort of plant that is there, but it's like a, 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 yeah, a combination of many of them and try to also use different shapes and different shades as well to really create that more realistic like look. The last one that I would like to show you is also one that contains quite a lot of information and is a rather recent one. So for this one we decided to also have a playful approach and uh, since the paper was about uh, engineering of an enzyme we literally took that theme and put a tiny excavator there who is modifying the entrance to the active site of the enzymes to make it accept larger molecules. And this is also like, again, uh, picking up the topic and transforming it into something playful. Design-wise, what you see here is something that I really like doing. So I really like to take my biomolecules and put them somewhere in a normal environment. So this is supposed to be something like a lab table where you have a bit of equipment that you normally find on a lab table, like um, a well plate, uh, a beaker with uh, some random liquid in it, or also like a flask in the background. Um, I enjoy images like this because it uh, allows me to depict something that I would normally not see in real life. So I take something that is realistic, like the table for example, like the excavator as well, and put all of those elements in a very uh, yeah, uncommon and non-realistic environment with a large enzyme in combination or a large biomolecule in combination here. Um, but this is again that is my personal preference and it's not something that you need to do. But I really enjoy having that kind of play with uh, realism and something that is so real, uh, what you normally would not be able to see. So I hope that I was able to give you a bit of insight on how cover design for scientific journals can look like and what my sort of journey concerning that topic was. 
as I mentioned before, in the next part of uh, that series, I would like to really get into designing a, a cover. And we are going to do that with Blender, of course. So I hope that you are also going to join me for the next tutorial, which is going to be the practical part. So see you in the next tutorial. Mm -hmm.